Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. I am speaking with wedding photographer and founder of Musea, Michael Howard. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How you doing? Good, man. Doing great. I, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for me and uh, <laughs> in, trans in transition, but uh, yeah. it's always nice to reconnect with old friends like you. Definitely. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who likes to jump right in and ask you questions about what you're up to. So let's do yeah. that. <laughs> what I have hope. you been up to, man? I know you've you've uh, you've been busy with Musea. You've uh, you've had a uh, you know you've had a the, the the launch of an online proofing site which uh, just took off like crazy. And then uh, you recently launched something called Labs, which is you print uh, for. Mm -hmm very specific people, uh, I'm assuming very specific uh, photographers, uh, images on, yeah. a, on, a, on a, an Epson, is that right? An Epson printer? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, so tell, tell us a little bit about you know, what you've been up to. Uh, well, a little, yeah, a little bit of everything. A little so bit of everything, of course. I think that's kind of par for the course. But yeah, I've been running uh, Musea Store, which is our online proofing system for the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've uh, got a lot of you know exciting things with that. We just released a brand new user interface a couple months ago, uh, and our focus with that is really on helping photographers actually sell prints. Mm -hmm. um, I think with online proofing, there's a lot of the hot trend right now is obviously just allowing your clients to digitally download those, which I think is uh, one way to approach it. But our approach is to really help photographers get tangible prints in the hands of clients and make some extra income. Mm -hmm. And so that's our focus and where we're um, all about. And so that's what our system is, is built on. And so we're the first online proofing system, which we just released in May, where you can actually compare uh, sizes of images within the user interface. So clients can, as they're shopping, they can see like what a 24 by 30 looks like over a couch versus an 8 by 10, for example. So with the hope that it will help them you know, as they compare and see the size difference, that they'll maybe bump up and buy, a, you know, a print a little bit bigger than what they were thinking mm -hmm. from buying, mm -hmm. versus just a list of products that they have no idea what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's where that is at. And yeah, and uh, we just, uh, 12 weeks ago, I think, we just, we launched the Musea Lab. And so we are printing uh, a very exclusive um, type of print. So we're just doing fine art paper on Han and Mule. Mm -hmm. Uh, pr paper. So we have three types of paper. So it's really for photographers that want to offer a really high-end product. Uh, the paper is obviously thicker. It's you know cotton-based. It it has a very tangible feel to it. Um, versus getting the really thin kind of Fuji Kodak paper uh, that's just kind of flimsy. It can crease easy. Um, and it also you know it's the same feel of paper that if they get it from Walgreens or they get it from a professional lab, it's the same thickness mm -hmm. and all that. So mm -hmm. it's, they don't feel like a, it's not an obvious quality difference. It doesn't have the so, weight. Yeah, right. it doesn't have the weight to it. Yeah. Thin, where ours is thicker and it, when you hold it, it just feels important, you know? Okay. Um, and we're, since we're specializing in that, uh, we're actually, our price is extremely competitive. It's actually lower than um, a lot of other Mm -hmm. labs that offer the same type of paper right. um, because we don't have the overhead and things involved and we're, that's the only thing we're doing. Is your storefront now connected to the labs? Or is it that... is not auto-fulfillment. Okay. Um, we're going to head there. That's okay. kind of Excellent. where we're going to head over the next year or two. Um, we are, uh, I'm working with a developer right now. We're going to be integrating uh, the ordering process into the Musea account system. And okay. so hopefully in the next uh, three or four weeks that'll actually be done. Okay. It'll still be self fulfillment, but it'll all be on one thing, and you'll be able to track like your, you know, if it's printed or if it's shipped or all of that stuff. Oh, excellent! Wow. So lots, lots more advancements in in that space for you. Um, mm -hmm. You also have a podcast. Uh, with yeah. Some amazing, amazing <laughs> people there. Um, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful to just sit there and listen to these guys uh, or ladies uh, just talk about their art and, mm -hmm. and and figure out you know how everyone uh, approaches their business in a very different way. So mm -hmm. thanks for doing that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah. One of the things that at first attracted me to Musea was the fact that a, a small percentage of your profits, uh, I guess, go towards 
supportingwater.org, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and how many people have you helped so far uh, through this this idea of yours, where you you, you know you take a certain percentage that mm -hmm. photographers are spending through Musea and you give it away to water.org? Yeah, uh, all the sales yeah they go through our online program system. So mm -hmm. two percent of that goes directly to water.org. Uh, I need to balance out include what we did last month, uh, which was our best June ever. So this is our third June. It was our best June ever. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll be uh, once I balance that, we'll be over 160 people that we've wow. helped receive clean water for life. So it's something we're really proud of. Yeah. Uh, and excited, and I, I feel like we're just getting started with all of that. That's fantastic. That's great. Um, one of the f one of the most important things that you've done is that. Uh, you, you, you've, you've set up a storefront for photographers. You, mm -hmm. You're now starting to do a lab where people can actually print things. But more than that, those are sort of like the craft side of things, I think. But mm -hmm. you're also more interested in uh, the sort of the, the approach and the philosophy of how photographers could and should probably uh, run their businesses. And you run a, a, an event called Musea Gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've had two in New York and one in Seattle, and I think the next one is in uh, San Francisco in 2015. Correct. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what Musea Gathering is all about and what, what are you trying to do with it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like for me, um, I mean, I have a fine art background in photography, and so I got my BFA, um, you know, back in 2002. And one of the things since the digital revolution and the Internet and everything that's come along is I really have just seen... Photography education has changed in a lot of ways, um, and some stuff is being lost. I feel like um, because of the internet and, and digital world we live in. And so, for me, like the reason I do the podcast and um, we started offering the gathering is just to fill that void uh, of education, and especially within the wedding and portrait photography space, uh, because I feel like that's an entry level that most photographers get into. Because uh, it's the easiest thing to start is a wedding or portrait business right now. And so a lot of those people are coming in with their self-taught and all that, which is great. Um, but I really want to help photographers learn from you know established pros that have been doing it for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and to also appreciate kind of the craft and the history of photography because I think the history is extremely important and I feel like some of that is getting getting lost these days um, and overall just to help our overall goal is just to help photographers create better images so that they can be more unique and have a long sustainable career uh, instead of just you know having a five ten year career and then they quit and burn out and right. all that yeah well, how, typically how many people do you have at the gathering Gatherings are very small, they're very intimate, mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, one of, the, one of the number one things that everybody says when they go, is they love the intimacy of it. Mm -hmm. So it's 20 people max, Wow. plus, plus the teachers. So it's, um, and we're only, right now we're only doing it once a year. So, um, yeah, so it's just, a, it's a very small number, um, and it's for a very specific type of photographer. Um, uh. The reason you've you've had it move from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, I mean, this time around at least, I mean, I'm assuming at mm -hmm. some point you're going to bring it back to the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, the reason you're moving it from place to place, is that to just make it easier for photographers to get to or, uh, you know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, because anytime I have it on the East Coast, people on the West Coast, are, they complain about plane tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you're going to so, hear it from the East Coast people, right? Yeah, I know. So I'm trying to keep it fair, you know. Maybe, I, th I think maybe. Kansas City might be a best bet. Yeah, just put it in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, we had it in New York City twice, which is fantastic because of there's so much photo history there. Right, and the museums right. are fantastic. Yeah. Um, and San Francisco actually has a lot of great stuff also. Right. Uh, and so I think we're, I'm really, really excited to have it there. Uh, in, in San Francisco one, it's, uh, there's a, a, a photo, uh, kind of dark room, uh, gallery space there. And so we're actually going to do something we've never done before, which is we're going to have a third day because it normally like a two and a half day event. We're going to add a third optional day and we're going to spend an entire day in the dark room. And so we're, I'm going to, I'm personally going to take, uh, whoever signs up through uh, shooting black and white film in the morning. We're gonna, I'm going to make them hand develop their own film oh, in nice. a wet dark room. 
Uh, they're going to print their own contact sheets, and they're actually going to make, you know, whatever time we have, we're going to make some prints. So they're going to go through the whole entire tangible process of a dark room in a day. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a lot of value in that, and I think that's some of that's being lost. But there is a resurgence of interest back in the dark room again mm-hmm. to kind of unplug right. and to get your hands, you know, dirty, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that, and that's something that uh, there's this easy setup in San Francisco, and it's just right downtown. It's going to be fantastic for for us to do. So I'm I'm really pumped. When does that take place? Uh, February 22nd. That's a Sunday night. We'll have kind of a meet and greet dinner, and then uh, 23rd and 24th. Uh, are the main days of the gathering, and the Wednesday, the twenty fifth, uh, February twenty fifth, two thousand fifteen, is the dark room day. Dark. Okay, the dark room day. Okay. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Um, and Monday, this coming, so Monday, uh, J- July fourteenth, we're getting ready to release a scholarship giveaway, and uh, so we're going to be giving away um, a seat. It's going to be um, just a contest online. It's going to winner will be picked at random, uh, but it's going to be a fourteen hundred dollar value. So you'll get a free seat. Wow. And it's the only one we're giving away. After that, just tickets will go on sale um, for the remaining 19 seats. Okay. Um, but yeah, it'll start next week. So Monday, the 14th through the, the Friday, Monday through Friday next week. Okay. Um, you know, you and I have talked um, in the past offline uh, when, when I have not been recording. <laughs> and yeah. we've, we've talked about things that are extremely important to us as, as professionals in the, in the photo industry. Um, what do you think is going on with uh, photographers uh, in terms of their business? What do you think in terms of, like, do you see a trend uh, amongst photographers right now in businesses right now that, that sort of troubles yeah. you? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I mean, I think there's, I'm, I'm seeing a greater divide, I think, in, if we're talking specifically the wedding and portrait industry. Yes. There's a greater divide, and I think part of this is why I got into online proofing and prints is because there's becoming almost a divide between photographers that just uh, are like all digital, and then there's photographers that really believe in like tangible products and prints for people. And there's not a lot of there's some people in the middle, obviously, but it's that split is becoming more defined. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think the digital thing obviously is great, but it's, I'm a little worried that it is heading towards kind of devalue. It's continuing to devalue what we do as photographers more and more, just because there's just a gluttony of it. Um, we're slowing down and creating prints and uh, really helping, you know, your clients have physical products in their lives, you know, and for the future generations. Um, I think that is starting to gain a little bit of steam again, um, and people are becoming more passionate about that. So I'm excited about that. Um, but just from an, an aesthetic view, and I think this is why we started the gathering is, um, I think there's, I, I think intimacy is being lost in a lot of photography nowadays. And so I, part of the reason we made the gathering so small uh, is to um, really push photographers into creating work that's more has a lot of int- intimacy really in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is on all levels of life. So this is intimacy in terms of the photographer being intimate with the gear they use. Mm-hmm. Um, not, and learn, you know, and not flip-flopping between every lens combination possible. Like kind of committing to, you know, if you committed to like two prime lenses and shot with those for 40 years, your work is going to naturally have an intimacy with it mm-hmm. that you're not if, than just buying the latest thing that always comes out. So there's kind of a commitment, intimacy, um, and just authenticity, authenticity that I feel like is lacking at times. And mm-hmm. so the gathering is about helping encourage photographers of like, hey, masters, the 20th century, they had this kind of level of commitment and intimacy to the work, and here's kind of why or how they did it. Um, and I just think our culture is really set up against that in a lot of ways. So it's something we have to fight for because, you know, f- Facebook and all the social media is great, but it doesn't really doesn't really foster deep intimacy in your life. It It's great to cast a wide net of social people, um, but it doesn't really dive deep into, into people's lives on a one-on-one basis. And so I think photography 
I think we're, we see some photographs, I see a lot of photographs now that are, technically I think they're really sound, but there's not a lot of intimacy between the photographer and the subject. Mm. And so, and so a lot of, obviously like the big trend is like huge, these epic landscapes and everybody's going to go shoot in Iceland uh, because it's, the vista is amazing. And uh, it's essentially kind of this idea of go find an amazing location, put your couple out in this awesome location where they're really tiny, maybe make them touch heads or something so they seem connected, and bam, you've got your epic shot that's going to go above their couch. You just see that formula over and over and over again. Um, and I, the gathering it kind of is there to encourage people, and I just want to encourage people that there's always a great photo within five feet of you. You don't have to go to Iceland in some epic place to get great photography. There's something intimate and magical going on right next to you if you just will pay attention and look at it. And so we just need, I just want photographers to be more intimate with how they see the world, figure out what they want to say about the world, um, and then create work that communicates that so that they'll be you know, sought after because the only place, you know, they'll, they'll actually have a voice and actually be saying something versus just kind of creating this Indeed. Epic stuff. Right. Um, can you give us an idea as to who might be presenting at the next uh, gathering? Yeah, everybody's locked in. So um, I will actually be presenting a little bit. Um, and then uh, John Dolan uh, is presenting. So he's from New York City. Uh, he's shot, he shoots tons of celebrity weddings, uh, but he also does commercial work. So he's shot for like Tiffany and Company. And um, he shoots some family stuff. So he shoots like Jerry Seinfeld's family. Uh, and things like that. Um, Holger Thoss, uh, him and John have had a shared studio space for a, a while. I think they're actually split now, but Holger does a lot of family stuff. Um, really high-end, really creative person. Um, he need, he's done a lot of high-end weddings also. Uh, Meg Smith, she's actually in San Francisco. Uh, she does a blend of kind of commercial wedding work. Uh, she shot um, like Jimmy Kimmel's wedding. She shot like Anne Hathaway's wedding. Um, so she's, she's shooting at a really high level, but she does like food photography and some commercial work as well. And then, uh, let's see, Susie Kushner's from New York City. Um, she's a food photographer, but she's really great at just understanding the creative process and living a creative life. And so, uh, she's been shooting for like 30 years. She's amazing. And then, um, Liz Banfield is, uh, the other teacher and she'll be coming from Minneapolis, Minnesota over to San Francisco. And she does also a mix of like high end weddings and um, commercial work. So she does she works with Tara Gerard a lot, which is a really high end wedding planner, uh, I think in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, but she she shot she also shoots Liz also shoots kind of she shot for like Target or she does some like kind of hospital mm. work up in uh, Minneapolis also. Um, but yeah, very experienced. Everybody's I mean you're learning from people that have like fifteen to 30 plus years in the industry mm -hmm. um, versus taking a workshop or learning from somebody that's only been doing it for five years that's just kind of hot right now. You know? well, what's interesting in what you just said is that almost everybody you mentioned uh, is doing something in addition to weddings. Yep. Is that a, is that a new thing? Because I was because uh, for the yeah. longest time I was told don't tell anybody that you do commercial work, you know, yeah. wedding photographer or the commercial yeah. photographers would say, you know, I, I don't tell anybody I do weddings, you know. Uh, but is that changed? Has it changed for you? You think um, things are things are loosey goosey where people can uh, people are yeah. open to the idea that, OK, he's a wedding photographer. She's a wedding photographer, but she does, uh, you know, she photographs babies and she photographs cupcakes and, you know, all this other stuff, like commercial yeah. work for Target, for instance. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that's that blows my mind. Yeah, I, well, I think they're the Liz, John, and Meg are the three that really do both. Um, I think they're they're really unique. I think they're very rare, and I don't think what they're doing is common, uh, honestly, um, because they're they're doing weddings at such a high level, um, and they're working. I mean, they're working with wedding planners and their client budgets. I mean, it's, you know, you're talking like 500,000 plus budget or more type of weddings. I mean, these are not um, your $30,000 weddings or whatever. I mean, these are really high-end stuff going on. Um, 
I mean, John just shot Kate Bosler's wedding or whatever, like last, like six months ago or something um, in Montana. But so John, John and Holger, this is something they, they talk about the gathering. They've always talked about um, this will be their third time teaching, but it's, they, they really believe in um, keeping what your wedding income only being about no more than 50% of your income. Mm-hmm. Um, they believe that you'll, if you can keep your wedding income to only 50% of what you do uh, and you pay your bills with the other 50% of photography, it keeps you, that other 50% really keeps you out of the wedding bubble or the, as they like to say, the, the echo chamber. Mm-hmm. And so you, you're, it keeps you from kind of just doing the cliche, cheesy stuff all the time, you know? You don't, you don't really pay attention to what everybody else is doing in the wedding industry because you're trying to hustle to get the other 50% of your business going, doing commercial work or whatever. And so you, you, it really forces you to be at a high, serious level because you're dealing with art directors, right. photo editors or magazines, things like that. Where 95% of the wedding photographers I know, they don't, they're not dealing with art directors at you know, major fashion label or... You know, they're not dealing with the photo editor at Martha Stewart magazine. Like, they, there's no connection there. Um, and these people are dealing with those people on a regular basis. Um, so they can talk in both worlds. And I think it just brings their photography to another level, you know. Um, but, mm-hmm. yeah, so, we'll, I mean, we'll see where it goes. But, um, but yeah, I think they're rare. Okay. Well, with that phone call that's coming through, <laughs> I'll say Perfect. goodbye. Thanks, buddy. Yeah.